yes, you're coming in loud and clear. Okay, thank you. So uh, today I'll present, be presenting the context and requirements for beam hopping. Nada will present beam hopping definitions and beam hopping systems uh, scenarios. Avi will present uh, the general description of, uh, of new formats for beam hopping and also the simulation and analysis. And uh, I will uh, finish with maintenance, further work and closing remarks. So without any further ado, I shall start on context and requirements for beam hopping. So um, DVBS2 to DVBS2X, well, DVBS2, the adventure started basically in March 2005 with the publication of the first two uh, EA um, uh, specification. Uh, it was updated in October 2014, mainly to um, uh, enable the efficient use of Ka band uh, transponders, where we um, modified the standard to increase the number of mod codes, provide very low SNR, so uh, uh, lower um, uh, character noise ratio possibilities. Higher efficiencies with up to 258 APSK, time slicing, a number of uh, roll offs, uh, scrambling to enable tighter beams, and some uh, channel bonding for improvements in statistical multiplexing. We thought we did a good job, we did. Um, but then uh, this was all very well, but. Um, the standard itself didn't really allow for dynamic reallocation of resources. The uh, satellite capacity tended to be um, fixed at launch. And um, the throughput, of the overall throughput of the satellite, uh, it was observed was, was mainly limited by the amplifiers and TWTs, both in terms of weight and power. And of course, uh, on the ground, some areas required much more traffic than other areas. And so it was finally obvious that we needed a much more flexibility in allocating bandwidth. So if we see uh, the, the chart at the bottom uh, right, we see the allocated bandwidth, the offered bandwidth is basically flat, it's the yellow lines, and the required bandwidth is being the, the, the red, which, which vary from cell to cell. Next. So, as time went by, uh, satellite technology moved on. Uh, satellites uh, were able to use ferrite switches, regenerative, regenerative payloads, electronically steerable antennas, and so on. And bandwidth could now be allocated to each cell as a function of time. And so the term beam hopping was coined, where the beam will switch from cell to cell on a time basis. And some studies, uh, the references given in the uh, implement, implementation guidelines, showed that up to 20% uh, improvement in unmet demand could be met by using beam hopping techniques. So in order to exploit the potential for beam hopping, it was clear that we had to uh, update the DVBS2X standard again. So in October 2017, the um, commercial module agreed that DVB uh, CMS should work on the commercial requirements. So um, uh, to amend the specification to include uh, beam hopping. And this was done under the chairmanship of Thomas Reddy. And in October 2018, the DVB SCM published a set of commercial requirements for beam hopping. And these are collectively known as the CMS 0050. Uh, the main requirements, without going into too much detail, was to enable a wider range of applications. So um, Internet of Things, flight connectivity, consumer broadband, maritime, IP trunking, and so on. That the standard should be evolutionary and not revolutionary. So 
based on what was done before and not inventing everything anew. The technical requirements included things like high illumination ratios, single or multiple carriers per beam, low power, low latency, etc., etc. All the things that engineers love. Um, interoperability was between the equipment, equipment providers and service providers was a must. And we should take a holistic approach. That is to say that if there were other linked standards that needed to be updated because DVBS 2X has been updated, then we should do so and include that in the work. So in June 2018, uh, DVBS TM uh, under the chairmanship of Alberto Morello was mandated to work on a new standard. So over to you, Nadia. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. I'm just about to share my, my slides. I hope it will come up smoothly. Um, is it visible, I hope, to you, Peter, and others? So uh, good afternoon again to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Nader Alaga. I'm going to take it from here, uh, defining some of the basic terms and terminologies we're using in the beam hopping and uh, elaborating on this towards the actual solutions that were offered uh, as part of the DVBS 2X uh, solution. So just uh, showing you uh, at the very high level uh, the actual uh, beam hopping system. Uh, we basically looking at uh, a multi-beam uh, satellite systems. We will talk later about different type of scenarios, but as a very simple uh, definitions, when we are talking about the beam, it's basically a radio signal that has been generated uh, or been uh, transmitted from a satellite payload towards a cluster of cells where on ground they're actually covering certain geographical area. And these cells are act uh, together being actually served with, with uh, this one beam. Uh, the actual process to go from one cell to the next is controlled by what we call as a beam hopping time plan or in more general case, beam hopping time frequency plan that determines the actual carousel that we are actually going through from one cell to the next, all within one cluster. In principle, a multi-beam satellite system may include more than one cluster, and each one of these clusters is supported by one transmission channel on board of a satellite. Now, to basic concept of the beam hopping, uh, what we have here is uh, uh, compared to uh, what is known conventionally in DVBS2 air interface protocol, we still have a modulator sitting at the gateway side, multiplexing traffic that comes uh, in towards a number of different users within different cells. Uh, from that point of view, we don't really see much of a difference. However, when the signal uh, reaches the satellite towards the end users, uh, we will see the actual switching between different cells. Uh, so what it means is that from the end user perspective, the incoming uh, signal uh, from the satellite is not going to be continuously visible. And according to this timing plan or the beam hopping time plan, it would be only a, a portion of the time that each user would actually see the forward link. Uh, the discussions here, of course, is mainly in our in the, uh, discussion here, we are talking about the forward link, which is from the satellite gateway towards the user terminal. But in reality, the uh, beam hopping can actually work on both directions. However, the air interfaces that are defined for the ret return link, they are already burst mode or uh, more like MFTDMA type of approach with a access scheme that allows you to have a burst uh, uh, switching from one to the other. So in that case, in terms of the definition, the focus of the activity is started from the DVBS2X, which is talking about the satellite gateway towards the user terminals. Now, just to give you a bit of a background, the actual work on the beam hopping just didn't start in 2018. Uh, we have been looking at this at least uh, for the past decade, not only in Europe, um, in all uh, different uh, initiatives from all over the world. Just to give you an exa a few examples, if you are interested, you can uh, visit some of these links that I have provided here to show you some of the proof of concepts of the beam hopping systems, both from the payload system uh, end to end uh, and the system architecture. These are the works that basically show a platform that allows us to uh, exercise the use of different components of the beam hopping. And even earlier than that, we had a number of studies looking at the end to end systems and how to optimize the use of the beam hopping. The results of those 
investigations, which now are going back in 2010, 2011, are actually been uh, provided to the DVBS2 and the actual uh, use of uh, the definition of the beam hopping systems. I have, just as an example, I go back to the same pictures that was shown by Peter, uh, showing a, a multi-beam uh, satellite system uh, providing a coverage over, over Europe uh, with, uh, as you can see on the top right, uh, with a large number of different um, uh, different beams with different amount of demands. And uh, accordingly, if you want to just use a conventional system, as was also mentioned by Avi, uh, by Peter, we're going to have a um, uh, allocation of um, the same amount of bit rate per each beam. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the flexibility of a beam hopping comes in when we actually see the uh, variation of this allocation per beam. And that's what is shown on the uh, right bottom of the page. Now, depending on scenario, there would be a different level of um, gain and different level of um, basically uh, 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 trade-offs. But what we can see is at least in certain scenarios, um, a capacity can be improved uh, by some numbers up to say 15% compared to the baseline. And we can reduce the, num uh, the amount of unmet capacity or excess capacity. Uh, this also allows us to have a better structure or architecture on board of a satellite in terms of the payload design. And although in, theoretically a beam hopping might be a dual solution of what we know as a multi-carrier systems with flexible use of carriers, but in terms of the architecture of the payload, satellite payload, there would be some gain in terms of the amount of mass and uh, power and other uh, resources used for, for the system. So from that perspective, the gain is quite uh, significant. Uh, moving on to actual definition of the, uh, the air interface, uh, what we have is basically starting point as mentioned by Abby, uh, by, sorry, by Peter, uh, the starting point we have is basically an evolution of the existing air interface, which is based on DVBS2X. And the idea here is to be able to uh, basically uh, improve or change that baseline towards uh, an air interface or protocol that allows us to have a beam hopping capability. Now, there are two basic elements here that we have to uh, keep in mind. One is uh, the fact that uh, in order to accommodate beam hopping, we need to uh, uh, appreciate the fact that some end users are not going to have a continuous reception of the signal. So every time we revisit a cell, uh, the user terminal has to adjust itself, adjust itself or synchronize itself to the incoming signal. It may not start from a cold start, but in it definitely it needs to learn or to align to incoming signal. And the other part of the story is that when you're switching from one beam or one cell to the next, there would be some dead zone or some uh, basically guard time that has to be put in place. So, so for that, there's an idle sequence. So these are the two elements that has to be improved, um, introduced to the uh, new uh, air interface protocol. And um, when we started the work on the beam hopping, there were of course different solutions being put forward, but in principle, both of them actually needed to address this, this um, uh, two principles in the definition of ray interface. Then when we started from that de definition, we went to uh, defining a generic model for the beam hopping. So basically trying to accommodate different technical characteristics that the beam hopping system should, uh, should already contain. And um, just to keep a very, um, perhaps uh, not very specific, but a bit more general uh, solution for the beam hopping, um, the idea of actually having a multiple frequency, multiple carriers within each cell or a single um, uh, carrier were both uh, of high interest. So basically what is shown here, uh, you can see from each uh, cell to the next or from one dual time to the next, we can see in principle, the number of carriers, the center of frequency and the bandwidth of each carrier can actually change. So when we're looking at different users at different cells, we might need to adjust all these um, uh, parameters. And in principle, uh, even if you follow an integer multiple in terms of time or a granularity, a, a fixed granularity, uh, when we are doing this switch, we still have to have the capability of accommodating a different number of uh, transmitted symbol per each carrier, because the symbol rate of course changes when you're changing the bandwidth. So all of these will come in 
as uh, some of the requirements later on in terms of the uh, uh, definition and the design of the, uh, the beam hopping protocol. Um, and of course, the starting point was to be as close as possible to the existing uh, DVBS2X. Now, in terms of the scenarios, um, it's already mentioned also by Peter that we are not looking at just one uh, specific uh, satellite systems. In principle, we should be able to accommodate um, different scenarios, including multi-beam geosatellite systems, geostationary, uh, providing uh, broadband services with a high throughput or very high throughput satellites uh, to, a, uh, to a large uh, coverage area. Uh, it should also be a system that allows us to operate with a medium Earth orbit satellite or a Leo Earth orbit constellation. So uh, in terms of the actual design, it's somewhat going beyond what was conventionally known under the DVB S2 solutions, that it's actually now opening the possibility of uh, all the other systems that are a bit perhaps in terms of the requirements could be um, in, in uh, introducing a new demands for the design. And in terms of the applications, we are looking at both broadband bidirectional traffic to fixed users, as, opposed, uh, as well as maritime and airborne in-flight communications. And in terms of the quality of service and the requirements on certain uh, technical aspects, such as uh, delay and jitter, voice over IP and uh, uh, applications like IoT are also of high interest. So uh, for example, on IoT, the fact that a user doesn't need to listen all the time or follow the signal all the time is something that uh, beam hopping can of course accommodate depending on the duty cycle that we, we have in mind. So overall these uh, plus uh, different technologies for the payload architecture uh, opens up quite a large number of different scenarios in terms of both design of a, a beam hopping architecture and payload as well as the solutions that uh, from both sides on the ground segment and the payload have to accommodate. Now, uh, from the operation strategy and the use of the system, uh, there are um, basically, uh, we can look at uh, the, um, the design from two different aspects. One is the fact that from the gateway towards the satellite, um, it is quite possible that we are thinking of uh, supporting multiple gateway community to this satellite. And from the satellite towards the end users, uh, there would be different ways to implement the beam hopping system. Um, in a very conventional way, as we have discussed so far, the idea is that we will see a cost, the number of clusters of cells, it, as shown here, three clusters. Uh, and the selection of these cells within a cluster, of course, comes from um, another approach of optimization depending on the system resources and allocation of resources. But from the air interface definition, all the combination of clusters, uh, the, the proximity of the uh, cells within a cluster or uh, the actual frequency reuse within the cluster or within a cell would be all a possible or different parameters that in, in principle can be changed or can be adjusted according to the needs of the uh, specific system. Now, in a pre-scheduled beam hopping uh, system, uh, the idea is that at a given time or at the, for at least for a period of time, uh, the actual definition of clusters and the allocation of cells per clusters are already done a priori and stays uh, within that cluster or that, that hopping for a period of time. And uh, when there is a change in the demand or other needs in the system, for example, the assignments of resources, uh, then the system would ad ad um, ad adapt itself to the new reality. For example, when we are talking about interflight communications, depending on the traffic demand going across Atlantic in one, uh, uh, during one days and nights, you may actually see a different uh, traffic profile and the system may need to adjust its allocation of the traffic on each route. Or for other reasons in um, a lower pace, we may need to change. But uh, when we're looking at the, this scenario, of course, uh, there's always uh, the duration of this beam hopping plan that needs to be adjusted um, to be allocated upfront. Uh, in reality, if you have a very agile change of the traffic, uh, even these beam hopping cycles may not be enough to accommodate the variations of the traffic or the agility that the system may need to, to have. Uh, 
That's why other uh, type of uh, scenarios were also uh, considered in our um, uh, working group. And that was in particular uh, when we're looking at the traffic driven beam hopping, where we are not really looking at the carousel of a very specific uh, periodic pattern. Basically, depending on the reality and the availability of the, or the demand, the actual allocation would, uh, would change or the, um, uh, the um, illumination of the cell uh, may change. Just to show you this uh, in a bit more detail, uh, in this uh, traffic driven beam hopping, what we will have, at least as one possible solution, is that we have a grid of fixed uh, allocation that is mm, given, uh, but in each cell, we may actually be dealing with only one user at a time. And when the traffic is ready to be sent to that user, uh, then it would be more like pointing to the user and sending the information that the term point and shoot is actually used. So this way uh, we can reduce the amount of jitter or the delay that is actually uh, introduced due to the scheduling. And instead of going waiting for the scheduler to uh, reach the next uh, time, the dwell time or a revisit time, it might be just when we have enough data to uh, accommodate the packet or to fill the packet, the data actually been sent. Uh, this, of course, opens up a new dimension of the uh, system scheduling in terms of the flexibility and uh, basically supporting the quality of service. But at the same time, it introduces also some new challenges in terms of the scheduler design, because now uh, basically everything would be very agile. The allocation of the uh, resources would be very agile. And uh, from the user perspective, then the, we cannot really count on a very predictive uh, predictable type of revisit time, which means that the user terminal has to be more uh, agile to accommodate or to acquire the forward link and to be able to, uh, to, to follow the signal or to log to it. So these are the kind of trade-offs that may come in and they would be an important part of the, uh, the design. Later on, Avi is going to elaborate more on the platform or the actual uh, uh, waveforms that can accommodate this. Now, given these kind of scenarios, the work that we actually uh, carried out during the uh, um, development of the DBBS to extreme hopping was to actually look into um, certain uh, scenarios from the channel model point, point of view that allows us to assess the capability of the proposed solutions to accommodate the new the reality of these scenarios. And for this, um, after a lot of discussions and exchanges on how to uh, keep in mind the, uh, the timeliness of the um, solution that we wanted to propose, as well as uh, the completeness. So the a list of different parameters were actually being proposed and um, basically looking at two major evaluation or operation um, modes. Uh, the evaluation were actually focused on the acquisition mode when you, a, a user, basically a user terminal needs to acquire the, the signal without having any prior knowledge, uh, except for, for example, the symbol rate and the center frequency, and the tracking mode that when the actual signal has been already acquired once, how, to can, how a, a, a user terminal can, can follow on to, to keep the tracking. For this, a set of um, parameters were used or were, were suggested that you see on this uh, plot uh, in this uh, slide. Um, you, uh, you perhaps you appreciate the difference between the acquisition and tracking in certain uh, values. For example, when you're talking about fre frequency offset uncertainty uh, for acquisition, we are expecting to have much wider range than the tracking, and this has been reflected the same for the symbol rate offset and other values. Then uh, the performance matrix for the acquisition and the tracking, uh, different uh, criteria were actually considered. For the acquisition, the actual time required for the acquisition known as mean acquisition time was one parameter we considered. And also the accuracy of the estimates. If you're looking at the carrier frequency offset, timing offset, or signal to noise ratio, it was important to know how accurate those values are. While when you're looking at the tracking mode, more frame error ratio and the header decoding ratios are the one that are more uh, meaningful uh, criteria or a matrix to be considered. The results of this um, basically trade-offs are later on are going to be shown by Avi in this uh, presentation that actually shows how these values are actually used uh, to validate the uh, waveforms that are used. So with that, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation and pass on this to, to Abby to continue.
Okay, thank you, Nader. I hope that everybody can see the screen now. Uh, let's go into some uh, technical details. In last October, the DVB approved the amendments for beam hopping, which includes some modification of the, for the Annex E of the standard. The approved standard added three additional formats to Annex E, which are basically based on the existing format 4 with small modifications. The most important of which is to allow variable super frame length and thus enable the system operator to flexibly plan the beam hopping pattern to provide the best fit to the traffic demand distribution. Uh, just a short background to those who are not familiar with uh, Annex E. Annex E was uh, added back in 2013 to the standard in order to allow some structure for advanced satellite technologies like high throughput satellites and Leo constellations, etc. Uh, while regular S2X frames are different in size, uh, the super frame provides structure to the waveform. The super frame starts with a preamble containing the start of super frame, SOSF, uh, here in the slide, and super frame format indication, SFFI. The super frame uh, fracture, <coughs> super frame fracture, uh, fun, sorry, the super frame structure allows for a different use cases to use different to define different formats and uh, we are using uh, we are de have defined uh, three different formats for special our special use cases uh, after uh, along this, uh, the the super frame structure we see blocks of non symbols here in blue which are called pilots and they are transmitted regularly the structure, this structure is overlaid over the stream of S2, S2X frames. Uh, each comes with header, PLH, this is a red uh, squares here. And um, thus they are encapsulated within uh, the super frame. Both the SOSF and pilots are coded by a self-specific walsh hadamard orthogonal code. In addition to that, a two-way scrambling structure is applied, namely the S SOFF, SOSF and pilots are scrambled with one sequence common to all cells, while the rest of the super frame, the payload symbols, are scrambled with a self-specific scrambling code. Uh, this structure enables the receiver to assess the interference coming from other cells, avoid it, or even uh, cancel it in some times. Now, this is the basic uh, Annex E super frame structure, which is common to all the formats. Uh, we already had in the standard the format 4. This format 4 had a special field called SFH super frame, uh, super frame header, and it able to support two important uh, features. One of them is the fragmentation, which means that uh, from the super frame, uh, in the super frame header, you have a pointer to the first complete, uh, to the first uh, PLH, PLH, complete frame within the super frame, which means that all the symbols which are in front of this uh, PLH belong to the previous frame. So you, this way you can change the super frame, the, the frames within the super frame structure and fragment the frame in the, if necessary. Another important uh, feature is VLSNR uh, support. Uh, we call VLSNR to all those uh, SNRs which are uh, down to minus 10 dB. And in order to support it, in uh, format 4, we have a special mode codes. And the mode codes, the modulation and coding schemes, include the uh, repetition or spreading of the frames such that they could be decoded by very low SNR. Uh, in very low scenario conditions. In addition to the, pay, uh, the payload mode code, the PLH, the physical, uh, layer, <coughs> physical layer header, is also uh, protected. It's also repeated two or five times and according to the SNR uh, required. And the level of protection is signaled by the PL uh, protection level indicator, which is in the SFH. In this way, if you have a, a scenario where all the, you have uh, terminals with large antennas and high SNR, 
you don't need to protect the PLH, and you can save on the overhead. On the other hand, in case of, uh, if you have uh, VLS and R terminals with small antennas, low uh, signal to noise ratio, you can protect the headers all along the super frame. So all the terminals in the cell can decode the headers. And if the frame itself is uh, protected or spread, then very low SNR terminals can decode it as well. Okay, so uh, this uh, structure is almost ready for beam hopping, but it's still not adequate for that. Two things are missing. First of all, the super frame length in Annex E was fixed. It was given as a one number in, in, in the standard which uh, makes it very difficult to allocate uh, dif uh, difficult, different dwell times in different uh, uh, beam hopping time plan, etc. Another thing which was missing was a post tumble that Nader mentioned, the end of the dwell. So for that, new formats uh, were uh, defined by the work group. So uh, in order to cover efficiently all possible scenarios and requirements, three formats shown here were defined. They are based on the existing super frame format for now, but, but now all of them, the super frame length is the system parameter. At the end of the beam hopping dwell, before the beam hops to another cell, there is a post tumble, which you can see here. A, it starts with a known sequence and then a set of dummy symbols, which actually uh, should cover the beam switching time. Now, so what's the difference between the three formats? Format five is for periodic beam hopping, pre-scheduled beam hopping and VLSNR. Because of this periodic beam hopping, uh, it has to, uh, it has the constraints of dwell time. So, it must, uh, the dwell must end somewhere and you don't want to pose a constraint on the frame. So you need fragmentation here. So it supports fragmentation like in format four. It's also support, support uh, VLSNR like in, in format four. Uh, format six and seven are for the case of a traffic driven beam hopping. Now you don't have the time constraints. So you can have the, the length as long or as short as you want. But in this case, the, our terminals suffer from a, a problem of acquisition because the time of, of the hop is not predictable. This, why, this is why the SFH, the super frame header of format five was replaced by EHF, which is a extended header field. In this external header field, there is a set of known symbols which the terminal can use in order to acquire the signal better. And there is another field which uh, the code uh, encode the PLI, the protection level, so you can uh, use this super frame with different uh, VLSNR levels, uh, SNR levels, including VLSNR. Uh, now the overhead associated with that is quite big, uh, especially with VLSNR and fragmentation. So uh, for that, format seven was also added. Format seven is the simplest of them all. Of them all, it doesn't have an SFH, a, a super frame header. It doesn't support fragmentation, doesn't support VLSNR. On the other hand, it has uh, more capacity and it's uh, much simpler to implement. Uh, after all, we saved on three acronyms and three acronyms means quite a lot when we design a system, doesn't it? Okay, uh, now uh, the standard was designed to give the system designer a lot of flexibility. Let's have a look at some examples of possible deployments. Uh, the first one, which you see here, uh, is a single super frame. If all the terminals within the cell with the, are more or less of the same SNR, so the protection level is uh, more or less equal, then you can use a single super frame for the entire dwell time. Uh, there is no limit in the standard for the size of the super frame. It can be any size that the designer wishes. Now, the second one is the case of multiple super frame. In this case, uh, you have a variety of terminals, some of them with large antennas, some of them with small antennas, uh, mobile, 
fixed, whatever. In this case, if you want to save on the overhead of uh, VLSNR terminals, you can split the dwell into several super frames. In each super frame, you put another protection level and uh, each super frame serves another type of terminals. You can also have very short dwells. In this case, the, the frame itself is longer than the place uh, than the super frame. So the, the frame starts in one dwell and then continues in the next. The st uh, standard allows that as well. And of course, the multiple multi-carry operation that uh, Nadal mentioned before is also possible. In this case, the dwell time is the same for all the carriers. Of course, the number of symbols in each uh, super frame will be different. The length, in, the duration in time of the headers of, and the uh, other fields are, dif uh, are different, of course, because the bandwidth is different. But anyway, the duration is the same and the post tumble is, uh, the post tumble can be used in order to uh, I adjust the sizes of all the frames to fit into the dwell time. Another use case is the grid operation. Uh, sometimes uh, it might be the, the flexibility that I described before might be traded off with restrictions on, hope on, uh, on a given grid. Uh, by that alignment of the super frame is ensured and intercell interference can be dealt with. It is also very beneficial to the receiver, which uh, knows where to search for the, sun, uh, for the signal. And if the estimated hop time is known, the acquisition can be more uh, reliable. Okay, so, uh, but before we dream of uh, thousands of satellites providing seamless sideband, low latency, high capacity communication everywhere, using the advantages of beam hopping, we first have to check if the waveforms we offer can really enable the operation of a receiver, uh, which has quite a difficult condition to receive burst transmission in a very low SNR. And indeed, um, as presented by another before, the work group focused to ensure that the waveforms provided uh, are, have all the necessary means for the terminal to acquire the signal and decode it even at uh, cold acquisition when it first requires the signal. This includes the acquisition mode, uh, namely detecting the signal and estimating its time, frequency, phase, and SNR. And uh, afterwards, the tracking mode uh, include, include the coding of the header, the headers, and the, and the data itself. In case of periodic beam hopping, uh, it might be also necessary to uh, learn the cycle time, the time it takes uh, from uh, one illumination to the next, and this also has to be uh, was simulated. Now, we're not going to, to wear you out with all the details uh, of the simulation. They were very encouraging. Uh, if you're interested, all the results or the derivation actually are in the newly published uh, uh, user implementation uh, user guide. Uh, uh, just to give you some idea of the numbers that we are using, uh, in the standard itself, the frame rate is in the order of the 10 to the minus 5. And as you can see the result here, the detection probability and false alarm rate is in order of magnitude lower. And as a result, the time to acquire burst, even if we take into account the whole acquisition process, which you see here, uh, is less, in average, less than one hop. And in order to learn the cycle time, it, uh, it takes about two and a half dwells, which means you have to the uh, encode one uh, dwell, then the next one, then you know the cycle time, and then on the third one you can uh, you can uh, learn the uh, you can validate the result that you, that you measured. Now the estimation parameter estima estimation of the time, the frequency in SNR are quite close to what you need in order to decode the signals itself with uh, low uh, error rate. 
as for as for the information detection results, it's actually the tracking uh, mode. And you see that the SF, uh, SFH detection and the PL in case of format five and the PLI detection in case of format six are quite good. Uh, two orders of, uh, of magnitude below the, the one of the information. And the degradation itself, as we saw in the in the simulation, is uh, very close to, and there is a degradation of about 0.1 dB, then continuous case. And this is, uh, those are quite good results. So we can say that best of the existing uh, standard, we managed to develop a standard which is wide range, flexible, and ready to provide the new generation of satellites, uh, waveforms by which the resources can be used optimally. Uh, Peter, please take over. Thank you, Avi. Um, so I'll now talk about maintenance, further work in closing and provide the closing remarks. Um, so uh, in terms of maintenance, uh, during our evaluation of DVBS2X, we saw that um, there was a problem of coexistence between um, standard S2X mod codes and very low SNR mod codes within the same carrier. Um, having identified this problem in a transition zone, uh, we were able to provide a solution basically or based upon the use of um, a structure within um, Annex C format six, uh, format six uh, which is our known correlation structure in this uh, diagram. And we called this the dummy synchronization frame. So within uh, standard DVBS 2X, you can now embed very low SNR frames and immediately prior to a very low SNR frame, one uses a dummy synchronization frame, which will ensure the correct uh, decoding of the following very low SNR frame. So we solved a, uh, this particular problem. In terms of con continuity, um, Alberto Romello, uh, uh, Morello uh, retired from DBBSTM in uh, approximately December uh, last year, and he was replaced by Vittoria Mignone, so we welcome Vittoria. And of course, the, uh, the work continues. So in terms of further work, uh, we are currently updating all of the linked standards, so DVBRCS, the GEC standard, uh, GEC standard, the uh, service information tables and so on, all to support beam hopping. So beam hopping time plans, satellite ephemeris uh, data and so on and so forth. And in terms of interoperability, uh, we have the verification and validation uh, work. So we're creating test plans or test patterns, common models, uh, a file exchange format, which is text-based, which should be human readable and machine readable, et cetera. And this should be made available to uh, within uh, the stand, standards working group to be able to resolve all of the uh, problems or most of the problems linked to the interpretation of what is now a complicated standard. Uh, next, so my concluded, uh, the concluding remarks are that the um, DVBS2 standard now uh, includes beam hopping. All of the commercial requirements for beam hopping have been met. And um, from my own personal point of view, and I think I'm uh, joined by all of the members of the DVB uh, working group, that this has been an excellent cooperation between multiple companies and institutions. And we can now be confident that what we have is a standard that is robust, forward-looking, and well-maintained. So thank you. I'll hand back to so yeah, Owen here in the project office, Peter, thank you very right. much indeed. And to Avi and to Nader. Um, 
indeed you've finished in good time to leave uh, plenty of time for us to go through some of the questions that have come in. I also see that one of our attendees, uh, Omri Levy there, has raised his hand. What I'm going to do, Omri, in case you did that by accident, I'm going to lower all hands. And if indeed you do have a question um, and want to ask that question, uh, I will come to you after we've dealt with these questions here. Um, I'll say to our panelists, whichever of you would like to answer these questions uh, or make a comment on them, please do just unmute and uh, we'll go for it. First one is from uh, Christoph who asks, um, how is the satellite synchronized with the uplink signal or station? He means the uplink signal is a list of consecutive signals that have to be sent to different cells or clusters. So how does the satellite know to which, this, to which cell the signals have to be sent and when? Who would like to come in on that one? One, if that's okay. Nader, okay. Uh, yeah, it's an actually a very good question and very relevant. Um, indeed, the uh, synchronization between the satellite and the uh, ground segment is uh, quite different than what is usually done in a, uh, a conventional systems. And solutions for this uh, could be also quite uh, variant depending on the system. Uh, Per se, DVBS2X solution, as it's been discussed today, is not meant to answer this particular uh, aspect. However, there are uh, solutions that are actually built upon the capability of the DVBS2X superframe. In some of the references I shared with you in one of the slides, you can actually go and see the activities that we have done on this particular topic. Um, just to give you maybe a uh, high overview, the synchronization can be either initiated directly by satellite, which of course means that it's out of band and the uh, exchange between satellite and the ground segment is done outside of the scope of the actual inbound uh, signal or um, the a receiver or at least a subset of receivers can listen to the signal that has been sent over the satellite and learn the, the pattern and uh, adjust the system by uh, closing the feedback loop towards the gateway. So these are possible solutions, but the, the overall solutions may not be the, only these two. And depending on the systems, there could be alternative ways of doing this. From the end user point of view, which is basically the, um, uh, the subject of the standardization, uh, the uh, synchronization between satellite and the ground uh, should, not, should be uh, transparent. So basically, uh, after the synchronization established, then the users are actually being connected to the system, at least in a more conventional way. Okay, good. Thank you for that answer, Nader. Uh, a few more questions here. One from Neil. Um, is there, uh, do you add in one of the formats an extended header to help acquisition? Is the SOSF not sufficient? Who would like to take that? Yes, I, I would like Abby. to take that. Uh, thank you for this uh, question. Uh, indeed, uh, synchronization in uh, uh, acquisition in very low SNR condition is not easy. And uh, what we uh, found out during the simulations that are all in the guidelines, by the way, uh, that the, you need about uh, 900 symbols in order to uh, get with acquisition. In case of um, Periodic beam hopping, then you can rely on the pilots for that. And uh, but for um, uh, traffic driven beam hopping, uh, where the time is not uh, known, then you need a little bit more uh, sim known symbols in order to help you acquire in this uh, in, in this very low SNR. So this is why the EHF uh, was uh, was added to format six. Um, now, uh, may, may I take the next question? Sorry, I, my microphone was muted there. I, you didn't. I, I thanked you there, Avi, for your response. Thank you, <laughs> and also wanted to say. Um, just in case people are leaving now, by the way, the slides are published already for this uh, webinar on the DBB website in the webinars section. Um, so we do have time for more questions. You'll take the next one there also from Neil. In the parameter estimates, the accuracy values are one standard deviation. Uh, yeah, yes, they are. 
Uh, in, the, in the guidelines, you find a, a very detailed table, which uh, also compares them to the camera or low bound for those uh, values. A little bit worse than the camera low, no, not too much. Okay, good. A uh, few more questions coming in. Mathieu um, asks, which kind of switching uh, needs to be used on satellite for cell hopping? Hmm. Okay, maybe I take this one. Another, yes. Yeah, basically there are different technologies. Uh, Peter already mentioned a few. Uh, you can think of the use of some ferrite switch that allows you to, without really doing having any mechanical device, uh, being allow, uh, allowing you to steer or to switch between uh, the, 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 the output of the uh, uh, amplifier. Uh, but there, it's not the only way. Uh, there could be also uh, ways of doing this via the beamforming, it's basically using active antennas. And of course, the actual time needed to do this uh, switching depends on the technology used. So okay. these are the two possibilities used. And uh, in some cases, this can be applied both on the transmit antenna and also on the receive antenna on board of the satellite. And of okay. course, this synchronization of these two needs to be also taken into account. Okay, staying with the topic of switching, Oscar is asking, is, this, is the super frame the minimum switching unit in beam hopping? Well, the super frame uh, in the, uh, today, it's uh, not for the new formats that are defined, uh, they don't have a fixed length. So in principle, we don't talk about uh, atom or the granularity that is the size of a super frame because the super frame size itself may change. Uh, but if you look at it as a very conventional way, there would be, it could be that you define multiples of a, uh, of a super frame within one dual time. Of course, to reduce the amount of uh, overhead, you may also extend the size of a super frame to adjust to this size of the dual time to minimize the amount of overhead we are sending. To, to have a better performance. So now the, the new uh, DVB-S2X allow us to actually have a, quite a number of different combinations of parameters to address the, uh, the dual time and the, the, the accuracy or the granularity. Good. Uh, several questions here bundled into one from uh, Philippe. What are the chipset complexities to support beam hopping? Um, you mentioned, of course, ma the many different formats uh, in Annex E. So should all of these formats be implemented? Are virtualized receivers possible? Uh, and he throws in on the end there, do you, do you plan to organize plug fests as, as DVB has done in the past? Well, I think it was more the industry than, than DVB that organized uh, plug fests uh, for, for, for DVB T2 in the past. So uh, uh, if you don't mind, I can take that. Um, the, uh, each uh, format within Annex E is optional, okay? So uh, one can decide just to implement format five, format six, format seven, or, or all of the formats. Um, in terms of plug fests, no, we're not planning on plug fests. What we're planning to do is VNV, and uh, it will be the exchange of files that, uh, that will enable um, uh, implementers to verify that they are compatible with the model, which is which has been agreed between all parties that have been involved with the VNV. Indeed, VNV is uh, verification and validation. And uh, since let's say the for the last little while now within DVB, that is uh, a clear added focus for all of the specification work to ensure that we don't just stop the work when we have finalized the spec, but we continue going on with this V and V phase. And so that will apply, of course, as you say, Peter, to, uh, to this new, to this new addition to DVB S2X as well. Um, there is a final question there from Samuel. Uh, you mentioned Mio and Leo during the presentation. Is there any specific study addressing this scenario with Annex E? Who would like to take that? Yeah, Another. maybe uh, Avi can compliment. Uh, from what I know, uh, there are now, the work is still uh, ongoing, as also mentioned by Peter, under uh, TMS, the working group, uh, where we are looking at um, the signalings that are needed for 
uh, the use of these uh, new DVPS 2X with the beam hopping capabilities. There we see some need, for example, to accommodate the ephemeris and uh, to uh, look into some of the uh, acquired signalings that may be not necessarily linked to uh, uh, geo, uh, but also uh, is meant to cover cases of Leo and, and Mio. It's a bit more a step approach that has been taken uh, in the past uh, couple of uh, working group meetings uh, to start from a geo, but also take this into account towards the Mio and, and Leo. Uh, there could be also studies outside of the DVB. Um, at the moment, I don't really have any, I don't recall anything in the public domain to refer you to. If I may compliment the answer to that question, uh, that is that um, the standard as written tends to describe the waveform that will be used. Um, and when describing the waveform, it doesn't necessarily take into account uh, things like um, uh, Doppler uh, within the standard per se. So it is something that is obviously very important when uh, designing um, a receiver, okay? But not necessarily necessary, necessary to be explicit in the description of the waveform. So yes, it's an important point, but um, I'm not sure that its place is necessarily within the the standard as written. Uh, leave others to comment. Okay, Avi, anything to add there? Yes, um, I, I really am not familiar with any specific studies on Leo. I'm uh, all, with some conversations that we had in with several uh, uh, Leo constellation. Uh, I would say uh, enterprise entrepreneurs in Leo. Conf uh, uh, constellations, uh, they are saying, most of them are saying that beam hopping is quite an essential part of, of uh, the deployment. After all, uh, uh, LEO satellites covers uh, useful places only about a third of, it, uh, of, uh, of the rotation time for per satellite. So it um, may well be, it may need the flexibility of allocating the resources to the right place. So uh, we do make an effort to make it uh, all the support for, uh, for Leo in the higher layers, as uh, Peter described before. Okay, well, I want to uh, say, I want to say thank you to Avi and to Nader and to Peter for taking the time to really prepare such an excellent detailed uh, presentation for us this afternoon. We had just about 100 participants on, which is really quite good for a, a DVB webinar on a, on a rather technical subject. So um, thank you very much to everyone who has joined. If you do work for a DVB member company, by the way, keep in mind that uh, you do have the right to um, follow and indeed contribute to the work of the commercial and technical uh, module groups on satellite and you can do that by creating your user account with your professional email address at member.dvb.org. So thank you to everybody who joined, uh, thank you again to our presenters and uh, we will see you for the next DVB webinar. Thank you, goodbye. Hmm.